On a brisk November morning in 1868, men from Baltimore came by ship to this bay on the west side of North Carolina's outer banks. Their daunting purpose here at this isolated storm-swept beach of Cape Hatteras was no less than to build the tallest brick lighthouse in the world. These humble men, joined by island laborers, endured storms, shipwrecks, sickness, and the threat of starvation. But 24 months later, the job was done. And on December 17, 1870, the oil lantern was lit, shining its warning 24 miles out to the sea. It was then that construction foreman Dexter Stetson and his men stood back and proudly gazed at what would someday be known as America's greatest sentinel, the Cape Hatteras Light. When the early morning sun paints the ocean swells in a glittering gold, there are visitors at Cape Hatteras Lighthouse. At the end of the day, when the sun sets over Pamlico Sound and the beach has been indented by thousands of footprints, there are visitors at Cape Hatteras Lighthouse. Like pilgrims to a shrine they come, more than half a million a year. They can hardly imagine the events that have taken place on these hallowed grounds, try as they might. Like a proud but weather-worn castle, this sentry by the sea has stood throughout storms of incredible fury and destruction, legendary acts of heroism, ravages of war, countless shipwrecks, human suffering and death. The lighthouse has also been there for more pleasant occasions for its keepers, their families and friends on the island. It has been the setting for reunions, marriage proposals, sunrise services and pony parades. Today, the Hatteras Lights image is ubiquitous, representing the pride of its community with signs welcoming guests into the safe harbors of motels, restaurants and churches. Painters and photographers capture its image, fishermen catch their fish in its shadow, and surfers glide the waves that have pounded these shores for all the ages. For the nation, it stands as the symbol of all lighthouses universally recognized, a memorial to the courage and daring of mariners on the sea and the compassion of those on shore who were dedicated to protecting them. I think the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse in particular represents the edge of, uh, between safety and danger. Uh, I think it represents uh, uh, the edge of America. It represents uh, a government that cares, that, uh, that has put, put that light there to, to help people so they don't get in trouble out in the shoals. Um, and, and I think it, it represents the best, perhaps, that uh, our government at its best. It kind of crowns the land around it, and uh, it's, it's kind of like an American castle. After having served its nation with honor for nearly two centuries, the Cape Hatteras Light Station, a symbol of steadfast endurance, is under siege by a relentless, eroding coastline. Though it saved countless ships and many more lives from the graveyard of the Atlantic, the Cape Hatteras Light may someday, too, become a victim of the merciless old ocean. This is the history of the Cape Hatteras Light, the standard bearer of all American lighthouses, a magnificent monument to the maritime heritage of our nation. Cape Hatteras has been known as a deadly passage to seafarers since the very first vessels attempted to navigate the eastern seaboard of the New World. Its submerged peninsula, Diamond Shoals, reaches out into the Atlantic Ocean like the bony finger of death, ready to grab the keels of wayward vessels plying the graveyard of the Atlantic. 
19th century surveys described the North Carolina coast in these words. With the exception of Nantucket Shoals, it is supposed that there is no part of the American coast where vessels are more exposed to shipwreck than they are in passing along the shores of North Carolina in the neighborhood of these shoals. It is fortunate indeed if the friendless mariner escapes with his life. The Gulf Stream uh, actually touches the outer reaches of Diamond Shoals there, something like 14 miles off the Cape itself. And at the same time, the prevailing breeze and wind is from the southwest. And when you get a strong southwest wind, plus that uh, Gulf Stream current, uh, sailing vessels just couldn't make it. They couldn't get around. And so they would be backed up behind the Cape for a long, long time. There are a number of, of, of accounts of mariners, because many have been high-ranking officers, who dreaded the passage and dreaded it because they had had the most horrible experience of their life once before, trying to get around Diamond Shoal. From the journal of Captain L.S. Tors. It blew a heavy gale, and I drifted ever so far offshore into the Gulf Stream. This cold air on this warm water made the ghostliest sight I ever laid my eyes on before. It would seem I saw thousands of water spouts. The next I see some great city, and to be honest, I felt scared. I expected every moment to be ruined over. The wind continued, and we continued to see these phantom ships, cities, forestry, and water spouts. The first efforts made to guide the friendless mariner on the Carolina coast may have occurred in 1715. It was then that the North Carolina Assembly made Ocracoke Inlet the principal port of entry for the northern half of the province. And it was likely there would have been some provision made for navigators entering the twists and turns of the channel. Had there been a beacon at Ocracoke at that time, then it surely shined on the notorious pirate Blackbeard. During his two-year stint as a buccaneer captain, the shrewd pirate negotiated a pardon from the governor in Bath. In exchange, Blackbeard shared with the governor spoils from ships as he continued his raids off the outer banks. At the behest of the Virginia governor, he was captured and killed at Ocracoke Inlet in 1718. A few years later, Blackbeard's assumed name of Thatch, sometimes pronounced Teach, appeared on this map along with the first written reference to a lighthouse in the area. In fact, two. Surveyor General Edward Mosley's sailing instructions for entering Ocracoke Inlet read, In the middle of the inlet lies a small island having two large beacons on it. You must bring them in one, and your course will be west by north. Then steer up along said beacon island till you bring Thatcher's Hall to bear, east-northeast. And there come up to an anchor in five or six fathoms water. Mosley's 1733 chart then adds this reassuring note. The coast is now generally inhabited by the English and very safe for vessels in distress to come ashore. Nor is there any danger from Indians, none now inhabiting the seacoast, but about six or eight at Hatteras who dwell among the English. There was no mention of any potential danger from pirates or corrupt government officials on Mosley's map, even though 15 years earlier he led the investigation of Blackbeard's backroom business relationship with the provincial governor and his cohorts. The two beacons at Ocracoke must have washed away by 1794 because it was then that the fledgling Treasury Department headed by Alexander Hamilton was asked to build a new lighthouse for Ocracoke Inlet. Another tower was at that time well under construction on Cape Island at Cape Fear. 
but a survey of the Carolina coast reported that far more people would benefit from a light tower at Cape Hatteras. So it was that in April, Congress authorized the construction of a lighthouse on the headland of Cape Hatteras. At the end of the 18th century, North Carolina's barrier islands were essentially wide and flat, only a few feet above sea level. Free-ranging livestock and clear cutting by settlers had already begun to alter the landscape. Scattered natural dunes, wide sand flats, open grassland, forested areas and sound side salt marshes were the predominant features of the time. And every now and then, there were great mountains of sand amassed over centuries, slowly and imperceptibly marching south by the force of the wind. Best known among these galloping dunes was Jockey's Ridge at Nag's Head. There was one too on the beach of Cape Hatteras, and it was on this hill that surveyors chose to build the new lighthouse. Four acres of the headland of the Cape were sold by the Jeanette family to the United States for the sum of twelve and a half dollars an acre. Affording the most eligible site for a lighthouse, according to the General Assembly in Raleigh, November 1797. What no one seemed to realize at the time was that not only was this modest sand hill migrating, but the high tide line nearly a mile to the east was rapidly eroding in the direction of the future lighthouse. It was a decision that would dictate the course of events at Cape Hatteras for the next two centuries. Clearly, putting the lighthouse on the dune was intended to keep the foundation above the occasional storm overwash and to gain an extra 20 feet of elevation for the lantern. Yet eight years later, the same plan was rejected as too perilous at Cape Lookout. Most likely, there were concerns at Hatteras that the tower would be barely adequate to warn ships off the end of Diamond Shoals over 10 miles away. At the time, None of the nation's lighthouses were taller than 100 feet. Even before the foundation was laid, there was worry about the hill's instability. In Edenton, the collector of customs who disbursed the $50 for the site wrote, The hill on which the lighthouse will stand is at present well covered with live oak and other trees, and it would be well to direct the builder to cut as few of them off as possible particularly on the declivity of it. The trees, if left standing, will prevent the ground from washing. There's no way to know if the builder followed the collector's advice, but within 10 years, much of the hill would already be gone. The lighthouse's location was also chosen for its proximity to navigable access on Pamlico Sound, through which materials would have to be delivered. They had to pick the site, that was uh, totally isolated, accessible only by water, uh, certainly not from the ocean side, from the sounds. The sound waters are very shallow, and yet they had to bring in this tremendous amount of material. These heavy, stone-laden ships would have to come in through Hatteras Inlet, up Cape Channel to a spot about five miles out in the sound. Henry Dearborn, former congressman from Massachusetts, was hired to build the lighthouse, along with a new one at Ocrocket Inlet. The octagonal Hatteras light was to be 90 feet of granite and sandstone, capped by a 12-foot tall lantern gallery. Dearborn's proposal to build both lighthouses in a good and workmanlike manner, with all possible speed, was for the sum of $38,450. It was approved with the signature of President John Adams on September 21st, 1798. Almost a year later, Dearborn arrived on the scene with the first load of materials. Work progressed well until the next summer when sickness ravaged the crew. After one man died, presumably from malaria, Dearborn expeditiously left the island leaving his assistant in charge. Because of the harsh conditions and other delays, 
It was not until four years later, on October 29, 1803, that the new light at Hatteras was reported to be operating. From then until 1854, the tan, unpainted lighthouse emitted a fixed white light on the occasions that it was working. Adam Gaskin, a Carteret County State Legislator, was appointed the first keeper by President Adams for an annual salary of $333. It didn't take long for the Cape Hatteras light to become besieged with problems. For mariners offshore, any interruption in the performance of the beacon was a serious problem, and on many occasions there would be no Hatteras light to guide them. The September storm in 1806 knocked the light out for well over a month, and in 1809 fire, one of many that would plague the keeper, destroyed all the glass in the lantern, again darkening the light for a significant period of time. And by 1810, much of the sand hill on which the lighthouse stood had blown away. Then there were the critics who complained of more aesthetic issues. So there, William Tatham to Treasury Secretary Gallatin, 1806. It is an architectural eyesore, made of two kinds of stone. And the tower seems too ponderous for the nature of its foundation. Improvements were made to the lighting apparatus after the War of 1812 by Winslow Lewis of Boston. At Hatteras, he installed 18 of his patented parabolic reflectors attached to argon lamps that somewhat improved the quality of the light. Yet there were still many nights when the light was not shining at all. And by 1817, criticism of the lighthouse revolved around the performance of its keeper, Joseph Farrell. A letter from John de Lacy of Beaufort to the Secretary of the Treasury included these scurrilous accusations. Light at Hatteras is very often without any light in the most tempestuous and dangerous weather. And it is frequently lighted and then permitted to go out entirely, which makes it more dangerous than if there was no light at all shown. It is alleged by some that lights are sometimes seen to the southward or northward of it, while the keeper of it, Mr. Farrell, being said to be commissioner of wrecks under state laws, gives room for suspicions. De Lacy also felt the appointment of keepers should be removed from the office of customs collector in Edenton, citing, the immediate district are his relatives and friends, and where all the wreckers and that melancholy occasions occur of their indulging their proverbial crudity. If there happens to be no light at the time of an accident, it will become at least an object of suspicion. But de Lacy's motives were not above their own suspicions. Along with his indictment of Farrell, he recommended his own friend and neighbor, retired ship's captain, William Bell, for the position of keeper at Hatteras. As for the accusation that Farrow allowed the light to go out, he answered that poor quality oil was the problem. Complaints persisted and eventually Joseph Farrow was replaced by the Edenton collector with Ferro Farrow. Ten years later, Ferro Farrow was fired for employing others to tend the light and was succeeded by Isaac Farrow, doing little to refute the issue of favoritism within the lighthouse establishment. While keepers continued to come and go throughout the years leading up to 1854, the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse suffered from a succession of controversies and ridicule frequently published in the national press. Criticism of the dim and sometimes non-existent light from the masters of the ships offshore was fast becoming a greater concern than the crumbling dune on which it stood unsteadily. The publisher of the Coast Pilot wrote this notice to Mariners following an inspection at Hatteras in 1850. The light is a notoriously bad one, and so far as can be judged from external appearances, it is badly kept. 
A slave apparently tends the light while the keeper is absent for as much as three months. But it was better than nothing under ideal circumstances. Uh, however, one, uh, the skipper of one of the, of the packets that uh, went by regularly said that uh, it was a disgrace that uh, uh, often when he was passing uh, Cape Hatteras, passing the outer fringes of Diamond Shoals, he couldn't distinguish the light in the lighthouse from that of passing steamers, except that the steamer lights were usually brighter. <laughs> Lieutenant David D. Porter, U.S. Navy, 1851. I always had so little confidence in the Cape Hatteras light that I have been guided by depth sounding, without the use of which, in fact, no vessel should pass Hatteras. The first nine trips I made, I never saw Hatteras at all. It has improved much laterally, but it is still a wretched light. Lieutenant H.G. Harstein had even more disdain for the nation's lighthouses. The lights on Hatteras, Lookout, Canaveral, and Cape Florida, if not improved, had better be dispensed with, as the navigator is apt to run ashore looking for them. It was time to make a change. The overall state of the nation's aids to navigation was far inferior to that of France and Great Britain. Congress formed the special board of professionals and mariners to replace the previous authorities. The board, in a 750-page report to the 32nd Congress on the quality of the nation's lighthouses, had this to say about Cape Hatteras. There is perhaps no light on the entire coast of the United States of greater value to the commerce and navigation of the country than this. There is no single light on the coast believed to require renovation more than this does. An elevation of 150 feet and a first-class illuminating apparatus are imperiously demanded and without unnecessary delay. In 1854, the new lighthouse board moved quickly to improve the Cape Hatteras light. Building a brick addition to the top of the old stone tower, raising the light to 150 feet above sea level. A revolving first order Fresnel lens made up of hundreds of lead crystal prisms and bullseye lenses cast the flashing white light 20 miles out to sea. The original Fresnel lens was a beautiful work of art from Paris. It had uh, hundreds of prisms, it was 13 feet tall, you could stand up in the center of it. It just is an experience to see one of those early Fresnel lenses. The lighthouse was also painted to distinguish it as a day mark, as many had wanted to do since it was first built, whitewashed for the first 70 feet and red to the base of the parapet. After 51 years of service, the old Cape Hatteras lighthouse was finally considered useful to seafarers passing deadly diamond shows. The Hatteras Light was not the only effort made to aid vessels attempting the perilous journey past the Cape. Since the beginning of the 19th century, engineers had wanted to mark the outer reaches of Diamond Shoals with a lighthouse, actually standing in the open ocean. Probably in the backs of the minds of the planners was the lighthouse on the famous Eddiston Rocks, first built in 1698, 10 miles off the southwest coast of England. But there was a vast difference between building on rock and what was found off the coast of North Carolina. An 1806 report to Congress found that to erect a lighthouse at sea on the loose and shifting sand of Diamond Shoals would be ill-advised. Still, throughout the next 150 years, there would be dreamers who thought it possible. The solution at the time was to moor a lightship 24 hours a day, 13 miles east-southeast of the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse, and this occurred in June of 1824. One can hardly imagine what life was like for the captain and his five crew members that were marooned on that tempestuous place, totally exposed to the worst the sea had to offer. Their brave assignment didn't last long. On two different occasions, 
During raging gales, the 300-ton vessel broke loose from its anchor line and was driven off station. The second time, in August 1827, the lightship became permanently anchored to the beach on Okrukuk Island. Navigators passing Cape Hatteras and consulting their charts would again look for a light that was not there. Not for 70 more years would there be another light at the end of the shoals. For ships heading down the coast, waiting for a favorable wind to turn their vessels from south to southwest around the shoals added to their frustration. Can you imagine you're in a commercial enterprise, you're transshipping some material here, got a shipload, and you're doing nothing, you're just waiting there. It's the same thing as if you had a truck and you had to keep it parked for two or three weeks. Uh, at an intersection, waiting, waiting for the light to change and from red to green. And uh, there was great impatience, I'm sure. And what more often happened than not was that they would try to go between the shoals. There are actually three shoals, and there are two channels, therefore. And uh, a lot of vessels uh, tried, were able to navigate those channels, but it was tricky, for the, the shoals were constantly uh, changing. And uh, uh, that's where many a vessel ended up, in trying to get through the shoals instead of going around the shoals. I can imagine now these captains not knowing exactly how to negotiate the two or three shoals. We had what we called the inner channel, which is about a mile and a half off Cape Point, and then the outer channel, which was about three miles offshore. If you didn't know what you were doing, then if you struck on those shoals, it was over with. You were drowned you'd better find the nearest thing to be able to float on and hope that some passing ship was going to be able to pick you up and that's where your hope lie. In fact, all of the local sailors who'd made a living off the sea used the more expedient and risky inside channel across the shoals. And by the mid 19th century, the natural widening of Hatteras Inlet made it the prevailing path to the port towns of Washington and New Bern. To aid the coaster's endeavors, the lighthouse board in 1856 built a 30-foot tall wood-framed beacon exhibiting a fixed white light near the point of Cape Hatteras. This little lighthouse, like its bigger brother a mile and a half to the north, was well-intentioned but poorly planned and sighted. In the 40 years of its existence, the beleaguered beacon was battered by the unrelenting force of storms and erosion. It was once knocked over and once submerged. Its sixth order Fresnel lens was stolen during the Civil War. It was decommissioned by bureaucrats and then reactivated by public demand. It was moved twice back from the advancing sea. It finally vanished from the maps and the official light list by the early 1900s and was soon after forgotten. Yet strangely, many of the potentious calamities of the Cape Hatteras Beacon would unfold again in a future lighthouse at the Cape. In May 20th, 1861, the state of North Carolina joined its southern neighbors and seceded from the Union. Confederate troops moved quickly to remove lenses and extinguish lighthouses up and down the coast to prevent the lights from guiding the larger Federal Navy. Cape Hatteras was one of the most strategic and its lens was taken to Washington, North Carolina. By the autumn, Union forces had reclaimed most of the outer banks and were anxious to relight the Hatteras Tower. They then headed north after rumors suggested that the Confederates had just destroyed the Body Island Lighthouse. In what would become known as the Chickamacomico Races, Confederate troops from Roanoke Island, with the intent of blowing up the Hatteras Lighthouse, attacked the 20th Indiana Regiment at the north end of Hatteras Island. The Federal troops forged a hasty and arduous retreat down the soft sandy island, trailed by hundreds of panicked residents. Fifteen hours later, 
the 20th Indiana reached and encircled the darkened Cape Hatteras lighthouse at midnight on October the 4th. Here we found water, and we used the lighthouse as a fort. Uh, we encamped for the night and woke up next morning feeling like sand crabs and ready like them to go into our holes could we find them. Reinforcement from Fort Hatteras to the south arrived the next day and chased the 3rd Georgia Regiment all the way back to Roanoke Island. The Cape Hatteras Lighthouse was saved from the Loyalists' dynamite. The beacon at Ocracoke, however, was raised about the same time by Union troops attempting to destroy the Confederate fort there, depicted in this engraving from the Illustrated London News. And one other attack on a North Carolina lighthouse, dynamite set by Confederate troops, failed to topple the three-year-old Cape Lookout light. The Cape Hatteras lighthouse was relighted at the beginning of the next summer. Six months later, on the last day of 1862, the ironclad Monitor, under tow and headed south to Beaufort Inlet, passed the Cape in a deadly gale. The beckoning beacon, could offer no comfort to the Monitor's crew of 65 men as the warship, swamped and sinking, surrendered to the graveyard of the Atlantic. Sixteen souls perished. On February 23, 1863, the 5th Massachusetts Volunteers reported for duty on the Outer Banks, and one of the men was the 20-year-old aspiring artist Edwin Graves Chapney. His wartime drawings included these rare depictions of the first Cape Hatteras light. When the Lighthouse Board's engineer reactivated the old Hatteras Lighthouse, he discovered a number of serious problems, including ominous cracks in the sandstone, worn-out wooden stairs, and erosion of the dune had continued unabated. W.J. Newman, District Engineer. At the base of the tower, a large quantity of dry brush is placed to keep the sand from blowing away. Any evil disposed person could, in a few minutes, collect the dry stuff fire the stairway, and the man on watch at the top of the tower would not have a chance to escape. Furthermore, high tides frequently flooded the area between the keeper's quarters, and the tower and the keepers could not go between the structures without getting wet. A plank walkway solved the problem of wet feet, but the cost to replace the pine stairs with cast iron would cost more than what the old lighthouse was worth, Newman wrote. The condition of the tower is such that it is not worth the contemplated outlay. The vibrations during heavy gales are alarming, and cracks in the old tower are extending. Even if all the minor defects are remedied, there exist those of construction and form which can never be cured. The structure is quite out of date and liable sooner or later to a disaster. District Engineer Newman must have gotten his point across because by March 1867, Congress appropriated $75,000 to build a new Cape Hatteras lighthouse, and they intended it to be seen and not cursed by sailors offshore.
when 54-year-old construction foreman Dexter Stetson of Lynn, Massachusetts, stepped off the boat and waded to shore at Back Landing Creek in November of 1868, his assignment was simply stated, but gigantic in scale. Dexter Stetson, the Lighthouse Board's foreman for this job, he was instructed by the Lighthouse Board to build a first-class lighthouse, and that money basically was no expense. They brought in the finest granite, cut granite from up north to build this lighthouse with, and they went to great pains to get stuff out here. From the very beginning, there were complications. Lennox and Burgess of Philadelphia, the contractor in charge of delivering materials, couldn't secure the ships for the first loads to arrive in deadline. The district engineer was furious. There is a large number of men engaged at Cape Hatteras who will soon have nothing to do but eat the rations furnished by the government. There were so many problems that they had to encounter there that they wouldn't normally. The accessibility of qualified labor to people experienced in the kind of construction. Uh, I don't suppose there was a brick mason on, on Hatteras Island at that time because they didn't have any bricks. And so all these, these millions of bricks were brought in and they had to have somebody who put them in place. And so they, in effect, they had to build a, a railroad to get to the lighthouse from the sound landing to haul the material over there. And it was a, it was a, a, a challenging job if I've ever heard of one. After Christmas, the foundation stones were delivered and following weeks of preparation, constructing housing, Boats, cranes, a wharf, and a railway system, work finally began on the tower. Almost overlooked by the lighthouse board in Washington was where to locate the new tower. The district engineer had chosen a site just 600 feet northeast of the old lighthouse because, as he said, it was secure from the destructive action of the wind, which had always so seriously threatened the foundation of the old tower. The location was further justified on the basis that it was close enough to the old lighthouse that charts and sailing instructions would not have to be altered. But it can be imagined that someone might have been concerned by the rapidly encroaching ocean which had eroded over 1,000 feet of beach in the previous 20 years. In fact, Washington was concerned enough to dispatch a committee to Hatteras Island to evaluate the building site. The committee arrived six months after the work had commenced and by then the foundation was well underway. The Lighthouse Board had little choice but to approve the site. There were trade-offs. Um, the, the beach uh, was clearly evident to the, the land planners and the architects for that structure of where the storms were penetrating to, and it was almost to the base of where the lighthouse was when it was first constructed. The old photos suggest that was a very flat, broad profile, and storm surge could run right up to the base of the lighthouse. And there's some historic records of water actually reaching the base of the lighthouse uh, uh, in the early part of the 1900s. So what I, I, I expect they were looking for is the uh, trade-off between a location inland so that a direct wave attack on the structure would not occur uh, but close enough to the ocean so that they would get maximum benefit from the position of the light. Only a couple of years later, the Lighthouse Board would build towers on Body Island and Cudatuck Beach as far back from the ocean as possible. Was Engineer Newman's choice of the location of the nation's largest and most important lighthouse a mistake? And was the decision to continue construction at the site based on saving money when previously the Lighthouse Board stated that nothing be omitted which will tend to give the Lighthouse a durable character. As was the case for the original Lighthouse, a safer location might have been found in the higher ground around Hatteras Woods, but again, getting the materials to the site would be a problem. They would load as much as 20, 25,000 bricks onto these flat bottom shallow draft scows and would have to bring these, by sail, bring these into the area that we call Back Landing Creek, which is a little over a mile from here. And at that point, they would unload 
the bricks and stone by hand yet again onto a tramway that ran just to the east of the ridge here and they would have oxen. They used livestock, uh, my understanding from the old timers who have had this, this story passed down from generation to generation to them. They would have an oxen on each side of the tramway. Go ahead and hook your ropes up and then the oxen would pull the uh, coal car, if you will, uh, full of stone and brick up to this area where it would be unloaded and used by the brick masons or the stone masons putting together the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse. The construction plans had been drawn up in Washington, D.C. and left nothing to guesswork. Over a million bricks would be used, along with granite, marble, iron, bronze, and glass. The massive tower was designed to stand on over 600 pilings driven deep into the sand, a standard practice for lighthouses of that day. But Stetson, after digging a hole six feet deep, was only able to drive a piling six feet deeper, the sand being as hard as rock. With permission from engineers, Stetson revised the plans and then summoned two young hattersmen by the names of Jeanette and Barnett who would someday proudly tell of how they helped to build the great lighthouse on the Cape. Captain Jeanette was 14 at the time. Captain Barnett, a uh, long-time life-saving service career, uh, was 17 at the time. And they were part of a crew that Dexter Stetson sent into Buxton Woods to gather 6-inch by 12-inch yellow pine timbers to be used on the foundation laid down in cross hatch style of the foundation of the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse. And for many years, they, as the stories go, they passed down to their children that that Cape Hatteras Lighthouse would not have been built the way it is had it not been for the contributions of the local people who took great pride under the supervision of Dexter Stetson in constructing Cape Hatteras Lighthouse. It's really a remarkable job of construction because in up before that point, they were using, they'd drive pilings down, and the pilings sometimes wouldn't, wouldn't really last. And uh, in fact, one of the lighthouses, the, the uh, first body island light fell over about a few months after they built it because they didn't put a good foundation under it. The government was trying to save money. Uh, <laughs> lost more in the end. At one point, Stetson's ingenuity was called upon to save the government a little money. One of the lighters with five of these huge granite cut granite blocks that are used on the octagonal foundation of the lighthouse. She toppled over, dumped that, those five blocks into Pamlico Sound. Now Dexter Stetson, the foreman uh, for the lighthouse board, had made a request to get these uh, more stone brought down to replace, but they were expensive. And Stetson's boss said, Dexter, Mr. Stetson, you retrieve those five blocks and we have nothing in the annual reports of the Lighthouse Board that indicate that more granite was sent down. So we assume that Mr. Stetson did what he had to do and retrieve those blocks off the bottom of Pamlico Sound, but that must have been a chore. Stetson was a man not only resourceful, but one who was unselfish as well. Unlike the first Hatteras Lighthouse builder, Henry Dearborn, who quickly left his construction site upon the first outbreak of deadly fever, Stetson, when his men fell ill, climbed the tower to pitch in. One time, much of his crew had malaria, and he got up there and helped lay bricks. He was down to two bricklayers at, uh, at one point, and he got up there and laid, laid bricks for a while. But uh, when he got all through building the light, uh, he put up a little sign down, down at the door saying, built by Dexter Stetson, <laughs> and the old lighthouse service made him take it down, which was too bad. If sickness slowed the construction of the lighthouse down, shipwrecks practically brought the project to an early end. The first was the Ida Nicholson, which was a sailing ship from Baltimore bound for Hatteras Inlet that had 101,000 bricks on it. And within sight of the Cape here, she toppled in heavy seas and dumped that entire load of brick somewhere out uh, abreast of uh, between 
Kenny Keaton Buxton, the village of Avon. For the construction crew and their livestock, the food and feed on board the Nicholson were more eagerly anticipated than the bricks. But distressingly, the provisions too went down with the ship. In less than three months, after having nothing to do but eat the rations furnished by the government, the construction crew was reported to be nearly out of food. Although there was probably no shortage of fish to eat, another schooner finally delivered supplies a few weeks later. Then in August of 1869, a second ship was lost. This one, the J. Parker, carrying 50,000 bricks, driven ashore in a gale off Nag's head. What could Dexter Stetson have been thinking when nor'easters or tropical storms were sinking ships and brought the ocean racing across the diminishing width of the beach to the very foot of his beloved lighthouse? They were fully aware of what was happening because after all they had already lost a lighthouse and uh, anyone uh, that spent any time in that area would have witnessed uh, frequent storm surges without the artificial dunes that were constructed in the 1930s and the profile was flat and broad and the storm surge would penetrate um, right over to the lighthouse and even into the quarters of the lighthouse keeper into the property area so I think they were fully aware of what was happening. By October, near the end of the first year of construction, the lighthouse base had reached to the top of the entrance of the ninth coin, the offset granite blocks that framed the octagonal corners. With this, the district engineer proudly remarked, that the lighthouse had begun to assume a very handsome, solid, and imposing appearance. By the middle of January 1870, the brick was laid to 25 feet above the granite base, and by the 1st of May, the tower reached nearly 100 feet off the ground. Work was progressing quickly, and on June 16th, the tower reached 153 feet. Finally, in November, the lighthouse board's lampist arrived at Hatteras to install the new first order Fresnel lens. And at dusk on December 17, 1870, two years after the start of construction, ships over 24 miles offshore could plainly see the tallest brick lighthouse in the world, faithfully flash its warning six times every minute. Months later, it was believed that the original Cape Hatteras lighthouse could topple over unpredictably, so it was unsentimentally blown up, crashing to the beach in a mass of ruins. Upon completion, the new lighthouse was painted with a red wash, but it was soon decided in Washington that a more distinctive paint scheme would make it more recognizable. Two black stripes making one and a half revolutions of the tower were proposed by the district engineer. The approved drawings were sent to the contractor, hired at the same time to paint the lighthouse at Cape Lookout. For years, many people believed that the painter got his lighthouses mixed up, for the diamond pattern on the lookout tower would have been more appropriate for the lighthouse standing watch over diamond shoals. Such was not the case, as the engineer clearly specified, black and white diagonal checkers for the Cape Lookout Lighthouse. Today, it is hard to imagine anything other than the candy cane stripes painted on the National Sentinel.
In the summer of 1879, cracks appeared running up the tower that keeper Oscar F. Rue attributed to a vicious lightning strike two months prior. And then on August 31st, 1886, an earthquake centered near Charleston rocked the tower with keeper Rue on watch standing out on the balcony. The lighthouse board filed this report. We felt an earthquake shock at 9.50 p.m. local time, lasting from 10 to 15 seconds. We were accompanied by a rumbling noise coming up from the tower. There were four shocks. They were severe enough to slightly crack the storm panes in the lantern tower. Then the tower would tremble and sway backward and forward like a tree shaking by the wind. The shock was so strong that we could not keep our backs against the parapet wall. It would throw us right from it. The swinging was from the northeast to the southwest. A lighthouse keeper, upon acceptance of his appointment, was required to take a solemn oath never to leave his post regardless of weather or other acts of God. In the earthquake of 1886, Hatteras keeper Oscar Rue kept his promise. Keepers were often among the first to sight ships in distress at sea, and during the great Christmas storm of 1884, the Hatteras Lighthouse crew were watching the lumber-laden barkentine Ephraim Williams. The ship, with nine forlorn souls aboard, was wallowing aimlessly north past the Hatteras Light. The men from Cape Hatteras Life-Saving Station followed her, slogging through five miles of soft sand until a distress flag appeared in the battered rigging of the masts. Despite crashing surf described by eyewitnesses as the worst ever seen on the island, seven brave men rowed out to rescue all the freezing crew members of the disintegrating ship. For the outer bankers, who served in the lighthouse and life-saving services charged with protecting the lives of strangers on the sea, it was all in the day's work. It was duty and honor and service. These were men that were brought up in the military tradition. They wanted these captains and crews to know that, by golly, when they passed by Cape Hatteras, they were seen and they were watched. That the captains and crews that brought the commerce of our entire nation up and down the eastern seaboard knew that there was competent help on this beach. The late 19th century brought a period of stability and professionalism to the nation's lighthouse service, and for the keepers and their families at Cape Hatteras, the daily routines of running a light station fell into a rhythm. There was always something for everyone to do. We've talked to a number of the, of the children who were born and grew up in lighthouses uh, before they were taken over by the Coast Guard, just before World War II, and uh, uh, all of those people just you know, worked as a family together to keep the light going. And if the father was sick, then the wife or the kids would, would take the oil up and light the lamp. And, and uh, uh, it was a wonderful way of life. And, and, I, and I think people had a sense of that, that they were needed in doing that. And that's something that I, that I, I think families today miss. You, the father goes off to his office and nobody quite knows what he does there. But here, here the kids knew how important the work was that their father did. And they got a chance to help doing that. Lighthouse keepers and their wives were at different times, lifesavers, school teachers, mechanics, farmers, and even ranchers. At the isolated Hatteras station, livestock grazed around the base of the lighthouse in fenced paddocks. Back at that point, 100 years ago, all these people on the islands, these were subsistence people. They had their own livestock. They would come out here to the beach, and this is where they would kill a cow. They would, because the sand could absorb the blood, the seagulls could eat all the, all the innards, the guts, and this is where they would clean and get their meat ready and take it in and put it on ice. 
In 1893, lighthouse service engineer Mr. H. Bamba showed up with his camera and captured these earliest photos taken of the station. This view of the lighthouse and keeper's residences was taken from the top of the old lighthouse dune. And here, the dune of the original lighthouse is plainly visible, for the time being stabilized by the remaining ruins of the old tower. In the evenings, the keeper and his assistants took turns climbing the 268 steps, lugging the brass oil carriers up to fuel the thirsty beacon. Taking breaks from the suffocating heat of the lantern gallery, they would step out into the fresh air of the balcony. There, they must have often talked about the increasing din of the pounding surf as it eroded its way ever closer and closer to the tower steps. It had now been quite some time since an effort had been made to mark the dreaded outer edge of Diamond Shoals, and the dream of actually building a lighthouse out there was once again revived. There is precedent all over the, all over the world for lighthouses being built on exposed islands, natural and man-made. Uh, the one closest to us is Morris Island in, uh, in Charleston, South Carolina Harbor, uh, which is buffeted by everything from little storms to Hugo's and has survived. And, and you can see some dramatic pictures of the waves uh, uh, crashing against the base of that lighthouse. In uh, 1889, at that time, Congress appropriated half a million dollars to build a lighthouse on the outer reaches of Diamond Shoals. How were they going to do it? They actually con contracted for $485,000 to have a big caisson built in Tidewater, Virginia. This thing was 45 feet high, 55 feet across. It was then towed and with with very thick walls uh, made of concrete. Uh, and it was actually towed to the outer reaches of Diamond Shoals and, and dropped there. Uh, and with the idea that then they would pump out inside, drop it down, and fill that with, with huge boulders, uh, at least two-ton boulders, and build an artificial island out there in the end of Diamond Shoals uh, on which they would build their 150-foot high lighthouse. Uh, unfortunately, a storm hit and the whole thing collapsed before they even began to dig it out. Undaunted, the lighthouse board then drew up these plans for a skeleton tower lighthouse that would stand on iron pilings driven 13 feet under the sand in 22 feet of water. No doubt this lighthouse station, dreamed up by a desk-bound bureaucrat in Washington, would have been a tough one in which to recruit its prospective keepers. Especially for those civil service workers who could remember the obliteration of the Minot's Ledge Tower off Massachusetts and its two keepers in an 1851 storm. Congress thought it a better idea to try once more to station a lightship on Diamond Shoals. Mother Nature again had other plans and the vessel known as Diamond Shoals No. 69 was driven hard onto the beach at Ocracook in the great August hurricane of 1899. Another lightship was dispatched to Diamond Shoals, the 71 as she was called. Her demise would come in 1918 by a new force to be reckoned with, rising from the depths of the dark ocean waters. Other light vessels continued on station at Diamond Shoals until 1967, when finally technology 
made possible this Texas-type tower to withstand even the worst of the graveyard of the Atlantic's weather. The turn of the century delivered exciting and sometimes ominous news to the isolated outpost at the Hatteras Light. Well before it was reported in the press, rumors were spreading down the banks that the two young bicycle mechanics from Ohio had flown their motorized contraption through the air just 60 miles to the north. What that would mean for the future, probably no one was quite sure. Another inventor named Reginald Fessenden brought strange equipment and a tower to Buxton and succeeded in transmitting a human voice as far as one could telegraph. No one was quite sure what that meant either. Just 11 years later, folks on the island found out when a young wireless operator at Hatteras named Richard Daly was one of the first to receive an SOS radioed from a vessel in distress and sinking somewhere at sea, spelling out the Morse code daily read the name HMS Titanic. Then in 1918, rumors of German submarines patrolling the waters just off the outer banks became a reality for the Hatteras Light Station crew when the Diamond Shoals lightship was gunned down and sunk by the U-140 as her crew frantically paddled to safety. The U-boats would return, even more lethal than before, sinking 60 Allied vessels in the first six months of 1942. During the day, the Nazi subs would surface to recharge their batteries, sometimes within clear view of the world's tallest brick lighthouse. But by then, the light itself was flashing from a new location. It was the eroding shoreline that would become the Kate Hatteras Light's most formidable adversary. Since the day the foundation was laid, 1,300 feet of beach had been lost, and by 1919, the ocean was just 300 feet from the base. Like a thief in the night, each time a storm moved out to sea, it took a piece of the island with it, and a piece of the hearts of the people who lived there. Throughout the 1920s, Congress chose not to respond to requests to spend more money to slow down the erosion. Finally, by 1933, the high tide mark was just 100 feet east of the tower. The situation was becoming equally desperate for the outer bankers who already lived a spare existence as the depression spread to the islands. Food was plentiful, but cash was hard to come by. In what became a crossroads in the history of the Outer Banks, and the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse as well, a major effort was undertaken to make the islands more accessible to tourists. A national seashore park was created by the Interior Department to preserve the wide open spaces and native plants and wildlife so that all could come and see. And that meant bridges and roads, which in turn meant that the beaches and inlets would somehow have to be stabilized. The Civilian Conservation Corps provided jobs to hundreds of young men installing sand fences and planting grass to build a barrier dune system. Nowhere was the job pursued more vigorously than in front of the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse. When sheet pile groins were finally installed by the lighthouse service as a protective barrier, it appeared to be too little, too late. The same August 1933 hurricane that cast the four-masted schooner G.A. Kohler out of the ocean like a toy also struck the Cape Hatteras light. Keeper Unica Jeanette and his assistants rushed their families to the relative protection of Buxton Village and then rode out the storm at the light station. 
Mr. Randy Jeanette, who was a son of the last lighthouse keeper. The last lighthouse keeper was Unaka Jeanette. Randy tells the story as a park ranger, as a park service employee, and now as a volunteer of the hurricane of 1933, which was a significant, significant hurricane. And the ocean overwash was to such an extent that Randy and his father pushed heavy furniture against the doors of the assistant lighthouse keeper's quarters over here. But yet the sea beat that door down and turned that furniture upside down. It, flooded, it flooded the entire premises of not only the assistant keeper's quarters, but also the principal keeper's quarters. This photo, taken from the upper floor of the keeper's house in the waning hours of the Force 10 storm, shows the ocean completely surrounding the lighthouse base. The old ways of lighthouse living and keeping at Cape Hatteras had come to an end. The station crew's families were quartered permanently in Buxton and their old homes at the lighthouse were boarded up. The lighthouse service in Washington was ready to abandon the lighthouse too and they began the process to build a steel tower 150 feet tall, nearly one and a half miles away. On a solemn day in May 1936, Keeper Jeanette took one last climb up the steep gallery steps to see the beautiful Fresnel lens he had lovingly cleaned for 17 years and the bronze and brass gears of the chariot wheel polished to a brilliant shine. With a brief walk around the parapet and a glance over the balcony at the encroaching sea, Jeanette left the tower for the final time. In stark contrast to the early years of the old Cape Hatteras light, so scorned for its inconsistent care, the modern day lighthouse under Jeanette's supervision had become the pride of the lighthouse service. Which was probably the best government agency there ever was. Uh, they had about 6,000 employees and only 33 of them uh, were lived in Washington, D.C. Everybody was out in the field taking care of lighthouses and they did a, uh, a wonderful job of taking uh, the coast of America and making it the best lit coast in the world. On Wednesday evening in May 1936, the new light at Cape Hatteras was switched on at the top of this steel skeleton tower along the road known as Buxton Back. If only William Tatham, who in 1806 had called the Hatteras light an architectural eyesore, could have seen this new lighthouse, how might he have described it? Uneka Jeanette stayed on for a while as keeper before being transferred to the Roanoke Marshes Light where he retired in 1943. The abandoned Cape Hatteras station was transferred to the care of the National Park Service. Neglected and considered derelict, the old lighthouse was vandalized and many of the crystal prisms of the first order Fresnel lenses were taken as souvenirs. Eventually, the remainder of the lens was removed by the U.S. Coast Guard, which had taken over responsibilities for the Lighthouse Bureau. The shoreline had moved within less than 200 feet of the lighthouse, essentially where it is right now. Uh, and it was abandoned. And they built a temporary structure back on the hill in the woods, in Buxton Woods. And uh, uh, for a period of something like 15 years, uh, the, the tower stood there, but there was no light in it. The light came from this temporary structure. And uh, then, as, as constantly happens in the Outer Banks, the erosion changed to accretion, and the beach began to build out. Ironically, the cycle of erosion and accretion had suddenly reversed the trend that had continued so many years. By 1950, the Coast Guard decided to return the light to the 208-foot tower, now generated by an aviation-style beacon. No one could have been happier than the residents of Hatteras Island, 
who had to endure the shock of seeing no light from the lighthouse after so many generations. In 1955, they threw a big party at the lighthouse, called the Pirates' Jamboree, and just about everybody came out. Signal flags fluttered in the gentle breeze as picnics were spread about the beach. There was a parade featuring the nation's only mounted Boy Scout troop, all the way up from Ocracook, watched by spectators with a bird's eye view. After the Jamboree, the lighthouse became the community meeting place. We would come to Cape Hatteras Lighthouse as our social gathering spot. And whenever boys would meet girls on vacation or local girls would meet boys on vacation, the lighthouse was a place to go. The old timers like to talk about the days when uh, the lighthouse too was their social center and their gathering spot. And baseball has always been very popular here. With roads now paved and bridges linking them to the mainland, tourists too started coming in droves to see the great lighthouse they had always heard about, and the park service was more than happy to show them the way. This 1953 photograph shows the road paved all the way to the lighthouse, waiting for the tourists and the development to arrive. Uh, we did face a situation here at the end of World War II that we had to rely on tourism for uh, uh, our basic source of income because uh, commercial fishing and service in the U.S. Coast Guard had pretty well dried out as the, as the basic sources. I loved it when I was a boy. Uh, it, was, um, it was the isolation meant that there was freedom. Uh, the tourists who were coming to the one area then, which was Old Nag's Head, uh, came here, took their shoes off when they arrived. It was a family uh, proposition, uh, very informal. Many couples get engaged at the Hatteras Lighthouse. Uh, every week in the summertime, somebody will come in our store and say, hey, we just got engaged at the lighthouse. You can just see the way their eyes light up and it's something special to them. One family came in the store uh, last summer and said, you know, uh, we have a tradition in our family that every summer we take our vacation and we get in the car and we leave uh, like some hour of darkness. And they were from, I believe, from Ohio, but they would drive so that they could be at the Hatteras Lighthouse at sunrise. Uh, on the first day of their vacation, they always watched the sun come up at the Hatteras Lighthouse, and that was a symbol, uh, a tradition in their family. That, that lighthouse had, had great meaning for them. The island back then was still littered with bones of old ships, reminders that the ocean would give and the ocean would take away. Almost as if the outer bankers who thrived off the material provided by wrecked ships from the sea were required to pay the ocean back for their father's land. And in the matter of the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse, the infamous graveyard of the Atlantic was calling in its debts. March 5, 1962, a broad high pressure area over eastern Canada and a dense spinning low northeast of the Bahamas combined to produce a catastrophic coastal storm. The Great Ash Wednesday Storm, a rare class 5 nor'easter, struck the outer banks of North Carolina during perigean spring tides and lasted for over three days. It produced open ocean waves over 30 feet high. The destructive force of the storm on the fragile strip of sand and dunes protecting the Cape Hatteras lighthouse was stunning. An old inlet closed for 300 years, reformed just north of Buxton and threatened to divide the island in two. The next 30 years brought many more assaults by the ocean, followed by defensive actions by the Park Service and others. 
sandbags, beach replenishment projects and three concrete walls called groins installed by the US Navy to protect their base adjacent to the lighthouse succeeded for a time to hold the ocean at bay. I can remember being out here with my brothers watching waves break and we didn't have that dune line that we have out in front of the lighthouse that you see, we didn't have that in 1968 because it had been a lot of heavy northeasters after northeaster. We'd had about three or four successive northeasters and it washed away the entire dune line. Now the waves would break about where they are now, maybe even a little closer inland. This was heavy storm surf, eight to 10 to 12 foot swells. The swells would break, the water would rush to the lighthouse smash up against the base and I remember very well as a youngster in that short 30 to 45 minute span watching these huge breakers crawl very quickly toward the lighthouse crashing up as high as the top coin that you see amidst the red brick uh, basically to where the black stripes begin I have seen surf storm surf crash that high In 1980, the southernmost groin that directly protected the lighthouse failed, and the ruins of the old Cape Hatteras lighthouse finally vanished into the surf. The storm seemed to come during holidays. There was once a Lincoln Day storm, and then the Halloween nor'easter of 92 stirred even the ghosts of the graveyard of the Atlantic with its 34-foot waves, lasting for 114 hours. Year after year, newspaper headlines would predict the lighthouse's imminent death. But with man's help, she has refused to give up. You see, with all things that concern life and property on North Carolina's outer banks, and with the endeavors of men and nature, nothing is predictable. There's a, there's a constant uh, state of flux. There is erosion and then there's accretion. Every wave coming in, every tide, certainly every storm uh, causes changes. And the very fact that in, in 1935, the lighthouse was abandoned because it, the sea was so close and then it started building out again. And it was then reactivated in the, in the late 40s and build out still further. Then it started eroding again. And that's, it's now uh, reached about where it was in 1935, or almost. And uh, uh, it could go either way, actually. The, the accretion could start in again, uh, or the erosion could increase again. You just can't tell. Many people like to surmise that when Dexter Stetson and his crew were constructing Cape Hatteras Lighthouse, that maybe, just maybe, they may have been thinking of many, many years down the road that the lighthouse would be in danger by the sea. Now, we'll never know, but judging by the sound construction that was used and the sturdiness of that lighthouse, that they intended to have that thing weather most anything that came down the pike. This grand and tenacious old tower, pride of Dexter Stetson, natives of Dare County, and lighthouse lovers across the nation, has stood for many a sunrise, and may or may not stand for many more. But the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse, America's greatest sentinel, will always live in our hearts.
The Graveyard of the Atlantic, 400 years of shipwrecks, mysteries, and heroic rescues. If you would like to purchase a VHS copy of this exciting new video series, call 800-647-3536. Part 1 explores shipwrecks from the 1500s to 1899. Hear about the rescues of the vessels Ephraim Williams and the Priscilla, and how shipwrecks provided a way of life and often a means of survival for the residents of these isolated barrier islands. Part 2 reviews the 20th century, including the ghost ship of Diamond Shoals and the carnage wrought by German submarines during two world wars. Discover the strange stories of Ocracoke's Jim Bomb Gaskell and the steamer Kazeeks. See rare film footage of Billy Mitchell's amazing 1923 demonstration of the lethal potential of air power. Call 800-647-3536 to order The Graveyard of the Atlantic. Each volume costs $19.95 plus $4 shipping and handling. This is your chance to own this collector's video series that will not be available on television. Call 800-647-3536. There's a place in America where you can stand on the highest mountain east of the Rockies, climb the nation's tallest brick lighthouse, and see the largest natural habitat zoo in the world. It's where great dreams built the golf capital of the world and America's largest private home. There's just one state where you can visit all these things and only one video series that can bring them into your home. North Carolina travel videos are the best way to prepare for your next vacation or to remember your last one. Call 1-800-647-3536 for any of the following features. North Carolina Video Travel Guide is a one-hour tour of the entire state and a celebration of North Carolina's uncommon physical beauty. North Carolina The Coast features aquariums, gardens, famous sea legends, and curious antique shops. Enjoy one of the most beautiful stretches of seashore in this half-hour program. The nature of North Carolina is a musical portrait of the four seasons in the Appalachian Mountains. Relaxing, inspiring, almost hypnotic, this 30-minute video is a coffee table book come to life. North Carolina Bed and Breakfast and Country Inns presents over 50 charming and unique accommodations across the Old North State. From a tobacco barn turned into a luxurious hideout to a mansion fit for a royal traveler, discover irresistible places to stay during your next vacation. And the Newcomer's Guide to the Triangle is an armchair tour of one of America's best places to live, Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill and Cary. See both the cosmopolitan and countryside of living in North Carolina's most desirable cities. North Carolina travel videos make the ideal gift. Call 1-800-647-3536 or send a check or money order for $19.95 plus $4 shipping and handling. <laughs> 